So let us, uh, well, if you have any questions, just come to me about rules, about uh, whatever, about problem with your office or with your hotel. And there is also Annalisa and the secretary to help you. And so let us start with the first talk by Charlotte Christiansen from NBI, Nisbor Institute in Copenhagen, which will speak about integrable domain walls in N equal four super young meals. Okay, thank you very much. Thank so, you. yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this nice place and to setting up this workshop, which I'm sure will be very interesting. Um, so, so what I will be speaking about is something which was motivated by understanding better the ADS-CFT correspondence if you introduce defects, but it turned out to have some important com implications all for, so for statistical physics. And what I will look at is um, a situation where we, con well, I, I will consider two different quantum field theories which both are relevant for ads CFT. I put it closer, like this. Yeah, okay, so, so I will consider two different quantum field theories which are of relevance for ADS CFT. And um, in those theories, I will introduce domain walls. So a domain wall is a co dimension one defect, a wall which separates two regions of space time where the theory is in different vacua. And what I would like to argue is that these domain walls can be viewed as integrable boundary states. And what I mean precisely by that should become clear uh, later. But the fact that they can be characterized in that way means that we have access to some exact info about uh, observables or correlation functions of the quantum field theories. And the work that I will be speaking about was done in collaboration mainly with Dinglon Wu and Konstantin Serembo, but there's also some previous work which was done with um, Dennis Müller. Okay, um, so as I said, what I will be speaking about was motivated by the ADS-CFT correspondence, but you don't need to know anything about the de technical details of that correspondence. So ADS-CFT is basically just a common framework for a string theory in 10 dimensions and a quantum field theory in lower dimensions. And this framework, it has a lot of symmetry. It has conformal symmetry. It has supersymmetry. And it also has a third kind of symmetry, you can say, namely integrability, at least when you're in the planar limit. And uh, I will always be in this limit. And uh, I will consider two cases where the integrability is very well understood, namely the case where we have a four-dimensional quantum field theory, which is n equals four super young mills, and the case where we have a three-dimensional quantum field theory, which is known as ABDM theory. But I will not consider the, so to say, pure ADS-CFT. I will introduce a domain wall on the field theory side, and that corresponds to, on the string theory side, introducing an additional brain, probe brain, which does not interfere with the usual uh, string theory background. In that way, I break conformal symmetry, at least partially, because with a domain wall, I don't have translational invariance. And depending on the precise nature of this domain wall, supersymmetry can be partially or completely broken. OK, so why should I be interested in studying these defect setups? Well, I've split the motivations in some motivations which originally drove our investigations, and then some motivations which were derived that we only in, understood uh, in the course of our investigations. So our first point was that since we can break the symmetries, conformal symmetry and supersymmetry in a very controlled manner, we could maybe in these defect setups gain some uh, insight about the interplay between integrability and conformal symmetry and supersymmetry. I mean, we could learn how much can we break conformal and supersymmetry without losing integrability. Um, we also had the idea that we wanted to test the ADS-CFT dictionary or correspondence in the case where some of the symmetries were broken. Uh, this is not what I will speak about today, but let me just say that all the tests that we performed in these defect setups, they came out uh, positive is in favor of the ADS-CFT dictionary. 
We were also hoping that we would get some exact results for novel types of observables that you have in these defect setups, such as one-point functions. And then uh, finally, we were hoping to produce some uh, conformal data that could be used as input for the boundary conformal bootstrap program, which is a, a very active uh, research program these days. And it then turned out that what we found actually had very close connections to statistical physics. It turned out that the observables that we wanted to compute, they could be formulated as um, overlaps. And these overlaps were actually important for the study of quantum quenches in statistical physics. And uh, these overlaps involve certain states, which were matrix product states, which are concepts that belong to the vocabulary of quantum information theory. So there were also some connections to that field. Another thing we learned that is that our studies gave us some new examples of integrable boundary states. And it also gave us a better understanding of what is an integrable boundary state at the discrete level. And finally, uh, we understood that there are some new, so to say, uh, uh, microscopic duality relations for correlation functions in ADS-CFT, uh, which have a very constraining, strong constraining power and predictive power as well. And these dualities uh, have nothing to do with the usual ADS-CFT duality is something which has to do of, with the underlying integrable system. Okay. Um, so this is the more precise plan of my talk. So I will uh, start by explaining why certain simple wave function overlaps are important and can be inter interpreted as correlation functions in these defect setups of ADS-CFT. And in particular, I will discuss what kinds of um, integrable boundary states which are relevant for ADS-CFT. Then I will show how these uh, overlaps with, of these integrable boundary states and certain eigenstates of a spin chain um, can be seen as correlation functions in N equals four superior mills. After that, I will turn to these duality relations that I mentioned before, which are the duality relations for the overlaps. And I will uh, show an example of how you can use these duality relations for predicting an overlap formula for the entire ABDM theory, uh, just from knowing its uh, form in a small subsector. And finally, I'll point out some future directions of this kind of research. Okay, um, so just a few words about ADS-CFT. So ADS-CFT, it comes with a dictionary which identifies conformal operators on the field theory side with string states on the string theory side. And we have understood that one way of, well, uh, understanding this is by identifying both objects as eigenstates of an integrable super spin chain. Okay, uh, and eigenstates in the super spin chain, I will denote as the brackets U. But now, I, I, as I said, I want to introduce a defect in the ADS-CFT background, uh, more precisely a code I mentioned one defect, so a defect that has one uh, coordinate perpendicular to it. And such a defect is known in the string theory language as a, a catch randall probe plane. So that's what it is on the string theory side. Um, in the language of the spin chain, I will represent this um, defect of probe brain by a boundary state. And we will see that it can be characterized as being integrable. And then it turns out that by co computing the overlap of this boundary state with a spin chain eigenstate, uh, I will get the one point function of the conformal operator, which is represented by the spin chain eigenstate. And uh, the fact that this, this is a boundary state can be characterized as integral means that I can get this in a closed form for, for any operator. I should say that the, this idea has been further developed. One can also, instead of having this domain wall, one can introduce a special kind of uh, determinant operators uh, and represent those by a boundary state. More precisely, you can take a pair of determinant operators and uh, represent by a boundary state. And then by taking the overlap of this boundary state where the 
spin chain icon state, you get a certain three point function, which involves these two determinant operators and a, a single trace operator in the field theory. Okay, but by this I will not speak so much about today, but the idea is similar. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so, so what do I mean by, by boundary states and integrable boundary states? Well, I imagine I have my fundamental system is a spin chain and um, a boundary state is simply a state of this spin chain. And the uh, state of the spin chain I can just uh, give by giving the spins at the L sides of the chain. So an eigenstate I will denote by U, as I said, but a boundary state will not be an eigenstate. It will not be a simple eigenstate and also not a simple linear combination of eigenstates. It will be some complicated spin chain state. And for the moment, I will say that a boundary state is integrable if the overlap with all eigenstates is computed in a closed form. And we will see later what this means. And um, I will, or one has, we have identified certain types of boundary states which are relevant for, for ADS CFT. So, so one type of boundary state which is relevant for ADS CFT are so called matrix product states. They are states where you sum over all configurations of the spin chain and to each spin state at a given site you associate a matrix and the coefficients in this expansion of all configurations is the trace of the corresponding uh, uh, matrices. Yeah? Okay, uh, this is a Hamiltonian of the spin chain. So the U's are eigenstates of the spin chain, so they fulfill the Schroeder equation. Uh, now I'm just speaking generally, but you can have in mind just the Heisenberg spin chain here, and then this is uh, using nearest neighbor spin spin interaction. Any eigenstate of the Heisenberg spin? Heisenberg spin chain in this case. But, but I will move to a, an integral super spin chain later, but you can always have in mind just the Heisenberg spin chain. Yeah? Uh, for the moment, I, I, I have periodic boundary conditions. These eigenstates that refer to the situation where the boundary conditions are periodic. Uh, are, yeah, per periodic. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm interested in two types. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. So one type of boundary state, which is interesting for media CFT is, is a matrix product state. Uh, and I'll show some explicit examples of these matrix product states in a while. Another type which is uh, relevant are valence bond states, uh, which are also just uh, called two-side product states. They are states which can be obtained by taking uh, tintering uh, two-side states a number of times. Um, and then recently there's a third type of integral boundary state which has come up and uh, well, they're not known yet if they are relevant for ADS CFT, but they're called cross cap states with an inspiration from two dimensional uh, field theories. And, and for the Heisenberg spin chain, they would, uh, a cross cap state would look like this. It's also a two side product state, but in this way here, the spin at side J is coupled or entangled with the spin at the diametrically opposite side if you have periodic boundary conditions. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, it's defined like that. You could probably also consider the other case. Uh, the paper I have in mind, they, they consider this state at least. But, but it's of course a state which is quite different from the other states that I consider because they couple spins which are diametrically opposite. And it turns out also to be integrable in the sense that you can find its overlap with all the eigenstates of, of the spin chain. 
and it remains to be seen what is the meaning in the context of ADS CFT. It could have something to do with the case uh, with quantum field theories with gauge groups SO or SP or uh, string theory backgrounds with non orientable manifolds. Anyway, <clears throat> okay, so. I call them these states integrable because I can always compute the exact overlap with the eigenstates. But what does it mean uh, more precisely? Well, we know what it means for a boundary state to be integrable in a continuous quantum field theory. That's something which was understood in the 90s by Goshel and Samolotikov. So what you need is that there's no particle production or annihilation at the boundary. And you need uh, that excitations just uh, have the sign of their momentum changed at the boundary. And in addition, they can have also some internal quantum numbers exchanged. But that's all what can happen. And then you also need that a certain boundary, young baxter equation has to be fulfilled. And that basically says that the order of scattering doesn't matter. You have the same amplitude for this process where uh, whether this one excitation scatters with the second one before or after it's reflected from the wall. I mean, I get the same amplitude of if I move this small cusp to the other side of, of the bigger cusp. That, that's the boundary young baxter equations. But, but this pertains to a situation where I have a, a boundary spa in space. One could equally well consider a boundary in time, and then one would have instead uh, some initial state, which would be related to the boundary state by weak rotation. And it's easy to translate to this situation what it means for the initial state to be integrable. Namely, uh, this condition of pure reflection, it translates into the criterion that you, the state has to be built from pairs of excitations with momentum plus and minus p. Can only have this type of uh, excitations. Well, that is a necessary condition. In principle, you also need that the Baxter, boundary and Baxter equation for states is fulfilled. But we, what is nice about this, uh, understanding is that it can easily be translated to the discrete level where you have uh, an integrable spin chain such as uh, the Heisenberg spin chain. So there you have a vacuum which consists of all the spins pointing downwards and you have excitations where some of the spins are flipped and excited states with k excitations are described as plane, plane waves with k momenta and in order for these states to be eigenstates the Momenta has to fulfill the beta equations. Um, and um, in order for a state to be built from excitations with only momenta plus and minus p, um, well, we need a, a criterion to decide if, if this is the case. It's, of course, not so difficult to find out if you have an eigenstate, but if you have one of these boundary states, it's not easy to see if it's built from excitations with momenta plus and minus p. Maybe the number of momenta is not even fixed, but there's a nice way where you can implement this criterion, namely an integrable spin chain like the Heisenberg spin chain. It has a number of conserved charges, more precisely L, well, L is the length of the spin chain, and they commute with each other and the Hamiltonian. But what is important here is that they can be split into two groups, uh, which are respectively even and odd under parity, that is under the exchange of all momenta with minus the same momenta. And then you can use as a condition uh, for integrability of a boundary state that is annihilated by all the odd charges. This is the only way in which it can consist only of pairs of excitations with momenta plus and minus p. And this has turned out to work very well. In all the cases where we have found this criterion to be fulfilled, we have also uh, been able to show that the boundary young Baxter equation is fulfilled. Yeah. But, but it's a very nice hands-on criterion because we have a completely operational expression for the charges and, and we can simply test this. Uh, yeah, excuse yeah. me. I, I'm wondering, um, because we, with boundary young baxter in principle, it could also have some kind of non-diagonal uh, K matrices. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, I'm not sure if the particle number is still conserved, right? Uh, um, I think I, it needs to be conserved to have... Uh, even if you have non-diagonal yes, yes. elements, okay, yes. but okay, but in that case, does it also correspond to this this condition or uh, be, because uh, if I remember correctly, yes. 
the, the authors of that paper, they probably only consider diagonal ones. It's true, they only consider diagonal yeah. ones, but um, uh, I think we also... Oh, so, so, and this condition is still satisfied. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, sorry, may I ask another question? So, um, is there any relevance to this problem, the, um, a problem of quasi-local charges? Of what? Of quasi-local charges. I mean, so you consider only, I guess, strictly local ones because you yes. have only L-conserved charges. Yes. But what about the quasi-local ones? Like, how do they enter in the characterization of boundaries, uh, the integrable states? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't made use of them. I mean, in print, what we do when we check this criterion is not to check each charge uh, one by one, but by exp encoding all the charges in the transfer matrix and then uh, taking some appropriate condition for the transfer matrix. Okay, because so, I know that the quasi-local charges have definitely become relevant for a lot of dynamics, but I don't mm -hmm. know whether they could be as easily categorized as um, the odd even in this case. But, but I guess they are somehow also encoded in the transfer matrix, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I have to think about it, but in some yeah. sense, but they're encoded in the higher level transfer matrix. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if you just use the usual one. I don't think you have that. Okay, uh, let, let's discuss it. Yeah, maybe yeah, afterwards. yeah definitely. Uh, we do nothing more than I've explained here. But, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have a very hands-on uh, way of checking whether a boundary state is integrable or not. Okay. Um, so let me now turn to this defect set up in, within ADS-CFT that I wanted uh, to study. And the boundary state of relevance for this setup is, turns out to be of matrix product state type. So now I consider my four-dimensional quantum field theory, which is N equals four super young meals. So it lives in four dimensions. And I now introduce a co-dimension one defect, so a three-dimensional wall that separates two regions of space-time with different ranks of the gauge group. Uh, so there's one coordinate perpendicular to the defect, um, which is x3. So on the left-hand side of the defect, I have gauge group un minus k, whereas on the right-hand side, I have gauge group un. Or more precisely, I have gauge group un when x3 tends to infinity. But for finite values of x3, I also have uh, the, the, the gauge symmetry over here is also broken to un minus k. Uh, in such a way that the symmetry is matched on the defect. And more precisely, the, uh, this symmetry breaking on the right-hand side is, uh, is realized by some of the scalar fields in my, my field theory having uh, non-trivial vacuum expectation values. And more precisely, these vacuum expectation values, they decay to zero far away from the defect, but they actually diverge as a defect. They constitute uh, what is known as a NAM pole. But uh, let me show you what they look like more precisely. So, so in N equals four super young mills, one has some gauge fields, some fermions, and some scalars. And um, to find the possi some possible uh, values for the classical fields, we consider a situation where all uh, fields vanish except for the scalar fields. And of scalars, there are six real ones in N equals four super young mills. We also assume that the, their classical values depend only on the distance from the defect. And that's because we want to end up with a defect uh, CFT. Then we should simply look at the classical motion, equations of motion for the scalar fields, and they look like this. Um, where there's a double commutator, which comes from the interactions that we have in N equals four super young meals. And this, uh, class, this uh, classical equation of motion, it has some interesting non-constant solutions. Uh, and I will look at one particular one, namely this one. Uh, in this one, three of the scalar fields have uh, zero vacuum expectation values, and three of them have non-trivial ones. And the non-trivial ones take this form here. So in general, the, the, classic, the fields are n by n matrices because they are in the joint representation of the gauge group. But um, there's a solution where I have a non-zero component here on the upper left-hand corner of size k times k for three of the scalar fields. And these three t i's, 
they have to constitute a k-dimensional irreducible representation of SU2. Then these equations here are fulfilled. And you should also notice that there's a 1 over x3 coming out in front here. This is the scaling that you need if you want to, to conserve uh, part of the conformal symmetry. Okay, this, this equation also fulfills what is called dynamic equations, and it means that the super symmetry is uh, half of the supersymmetries are conserved. Okay. And so, so this is what it looks like on the gauge theory side, my domain wall setup, and on the string theory side, um, we will not need it very much, but uh, let me show it anyway. So you have a 10 dimensional space for the string. And in this 10 dimensional space, you have a certain number of three dimensional brains, which generate our, so to say, four dimensional world where the quantum field theory lives. And in that background, you then put a single higher dimensional brain, a five dimensional one, which shares three dimensions with our four dimensional world. And in that way, it, it gives rise to this um, three-dimensional domain wall in the field theory. And that single higher dimensional brain, it has to have a special geometry, which is ages four times S2, and it lives into, inside the full ages five times S5 space of ages CFT. And there also needs to be some background gauge field, which has a certain flux through this sphere. And um, uh, more precisely, it has to have K units of magnetic flux on that sphere. And this is how this K, the size of the representation matrices in the field theory, turn up on the gauge theory, on, on the string theory side. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so now in this defect setup, now I'm back in the field theory side. We have broken translational invariance, and therefore we can have novel types of correlation functions. The simplest new type of correlation function we can have are, are one-point functions. So the usual argument that one-point functions have to be constant and therefore can be chosen to vanish. It doesn't work if you have a, a domain wall, of course. But still, the one-point functions are very much restricted by symmetries. More precisely, they have to take this form here. Uh, here, I'm talking about a one-point function which lives in the bulk, that is, away from the defect. So it can depend only on the distance to the defect, the conformal dimension of the operator when it's taking the one-point function off, and then there is some kind of structure constant that we have to compute. And that structure constant is not a normalization constant because the normalization is given by the behavior of the two-point functions very far from the defect. And now, due to these uh, vacuum expectation values that I just found, the operators which are built from scalars, they can have non-zero uh, one-point functions already at tree level. And we find these one-point functions by taking our good conformal operators um, and replacing the scale of fields inside them by the classical values. And the good conformal operators, they are linear combinations of single trace operators. And it's then inside these single traces that we have to replace the, uh, the fields by the classical values. Now, in general, the good conformal operators, they are complicated linear combinations of single trace operators, but we know exactly what these combinations are because uh, the good conformal operators must be uh, uh, identifiable with eigenstates of an integrable SO6 spin chain. That's an old famous work of Minahan and Sarembo. And the way the identification works is that the single trace operators built from some fields, phi i's, uh, they are identified with a spin chain state with uh, spins si. Well, of course, we have six different states of the spins corresponding to the six different scalar fields in inverse force of mills. And now I can formulate the computation of the one point function in a nice way by introducing my matrix product state in the um, SO6 spin chain. Namely, I sum over all possible configurations of my spin chain. And for each spin state, I associate the uh, representation matrix that I derived before. And then I sum over all configurations with a coefficient, which is the trace of the corresponding representation matrices. And notice that some of the matrices here are zero because there were only three of the scalar fields which had a non-trivial vacuum expectation value. And then uh, the, you can formulate the computation as the one-point function as the computation of the overlap between this matrix product state and the beta eigenstate U. Because what this 
thing here does when it's dotted to you is that it picks out the part of the beta eigenstate which has the same combination of the spins and then it replaces it with the trace of the corresponding representation matrices so it means that it implements exactly this uh, replacement uh, recipe up here and then to get the one point function i also have to divide by the norm of the beta eigenstate okay so this is how the matrix product states become relevant for for ads cft Uh, okay, so now one can compute, try to compute these overlaps uh, in various ways. For instance, one can do it by brute force uh, or semi-analytically using Mathematica. And when one does that, one finds that such uh, overlaps between matrix product states and beta eigenstates, they always take a particular form. And uh, when we can, one can do it for SUN spin chains or SO spin chains, and eventually also for super spin chains. So what one finds is that, uh, first of all, there is a selection rule for when there is an overlap between the beta eigenstate and the boundary state. Namely, the beta eigenstates state has to uh, have uh, only momenta which come in pairs of plus and minus p, or equivalent repetitives that come in pairs of plus and minus ui uh, but when then that, that is fulfilled then one finds a particular form of of the overlap with the matrix product state so this uh, form it has certain fixed ingredients which are always the same it turns out that there's always the super determinant of the Godeng matrix and the Godeng matrix it's a matrix which is formed from the beta repetitives and uh, it encodes the norm of the beta eigenstate or precisely the determinant of the Godeng matrix is the norm of the beta eigenstate and when you have this pairing of repetitives here that determinant actually factorizes in a product of two determinants that's uh, one calls determinant of d plus times determinant of d minus and this super determinant of the Godeng matrix is the ratio between these two objects here and it can actually be seen as a real super determinant uh, using the set two symmetry that one has uh, or set two grading that is implicit with the root configuration. Okay, so, so that's one element of the overlap formulas. On top of that, one typically has um, uh, ratios of Baxter polynomials. So Baxter polynomials are polynomials which have the beta roots, uh, uh, the beta repetitives as roots. And there can be more Baxter polynomials uh, if the spin chain is. Uh, more complicated than the Heisenberg spin chain. In general, there will be more different Baxter polynomials. And finally, one can have something which is more complicated than just a ratio, namely one can have sums of ratios of Baxter polynomials. And here, that is typically something you see when you have a matrix product state with k higher k, k higher than two. And here, this should actually be a k. And this is something which looks like a transfer matrices. So this is typically for matrix product states that you have these more complicated sums. It's more uh, simple if you have just these valence bond states, which were two side product states, that you typically don't have these sums, but only the super determinant of the Godeng matrix and then some ratio of extra polynomials. So it means that these um, valence bond states, they are in some sense more fundamental um, than the matrix product states. And uh, according, they can also be used as a starting point for deriving these more uh, complicated overlap formulas. So, so, so therefore, let me now uh, focus a bit more on these valence bond states. Okay, um, so I will jump now directly to showing you some overlap formulas for valence bond states. As I said, they were uh, the more simple ones. And here are some important overlap formulas for n equals four super young mills. Here's first the overlap formula with the valence bond state in the scalar sector. So now here I have considered a valence bond state, which is um, consists of these uh, terms here. And uh, here I have grouped uh, the six real scalar fields into three complex scalar fields and their complex conjugates. And this is the kind of valence bond state which comes becomes relevant uh, for, for ADS CFT. And for that case, the overlap formula looks like this. There's a super determinant of the Godeng matrix, 
and then there's a ratio of Baxter polynomials. And there's one polynomial for each node of the thinking diagram of the underlying uh, Lie algebra, which is in this case SO6, or, or this is probably more in the SU4 notation, where we have a thinking label one on the middle node. But, but there's one Baxter polynomial for, for each node, and you see the, all the three Baxter polynomials, they appear in a completely symmetric uh, combination and only with arguments zero and i over two. And I stress that this is the result for the overlap for any, any beta eigenstate and the valence bond state. So it's a completely closed formula. And of course, it depends on the beta roots of the state via, via these uh, vector polynomials. But now that formula can actually be extended to the complete n equals four super Yang mills theory, um, which uh, has a more complicated underlying uh, super Lie symmetry, uh, which can be described, uh, for instance, by this thinking diagram here. And if you use this thinking diagram to describe the symmetries of n equals four super Yang mills, then the overlap formula takes with the valence bond state takes this form here again with a super determinant and then some ratio of uh, Baxter polynomials. And again, there's one Baxter polynomial for each node in the uh, thinking diagram. And the Baxter polynomials, they come only with the arguments zero or i over two. And actually this overlap formula, it was found in a kind of the D2 of fashion because it was found by um, uh, by bootstrapping uh, a tree level result to higher loop orders. And then once that was done for the general matrix product state, then one could make an analytical continuation back to the valence bond state. So it was not derived from the valence bond state by, by analytical continuation from the, uh, from the matrix product state result. Um, but then I would like to show that actually this result uh, is singled out by having some very nice uh, transformation properties under what is known as uh, fermionic dualities of, of this underlying uh, super spin chain. Uh, so let me move on. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me try to explain what these uh, duality relations are. Well, they are. Uh, relations which can be encoded in what is known as the QQ system of, of the integrable spin chain or this integrable super spin chain. And this QQ system, it simply reflects the fact that there are many equivalent ways of writing the beta equations, which again reflects the fact that there are many different ways where you can choose the vacuum of the spin chain, then there are many different ways in which you can write, choose what is the first excitation, what is the next excitation, and so on. So for the Heisenberg spin chain, you can choose in two ways, what is the vacuum, then there's only one way of choosing the uh, excitation. But for the super as n equals four super young wheels, there are two to the eighth possible Q functions. And uh, one can depict these Q functions and the relations between them in a certain, uh, what is called a Hasset diagram, where the Q functions are at the nodes and all the connections, they represent the relations between the different Q functions. And um, these various Q functions, they are connected by two types of dualities. They can, uh, one is uh, denoted as fermionic dualities and the other one is bosonic dualities. And the fermionic dualities, they correspond to changes in the Dinkin diagram in the description of the system. Because for super Lie algebra, the Dinkin diagram is not unique. It can be chosen in different ways. Uh, and the bosonic dualities, they don't have a, a similar uh, description. But duality it sounds like something very fancy, but it is actually not very fancy. It's just a change of variables in the beta equations, where you take a Q function uh, corresponding to a particular node of the Dinkin diagram and replacing it by another Q function using some functional relation. So it's nothing but a change of variables. And uh, now it turns out that this, well, this uh, overlap with the valence bond state that I showed you before for the full and it was for super Yang theory is actually singled out by transforming in a particular way under these fermionic dualities. So you can basically determine it by, by knowing 
or requiring that it transforms nicely under these circumstances. Okay. Um, so let me say a little bit more about these fermionic dualities. So you can say that it's uh, transformations which allow you to move between different thinking diagrams when you describe the system. Um, and uh, for the moment, I, I consider only super groups of the types SUN slash M, which is the one which is relevant for uh, in with four super young meals. And the fermionic duality, as I said, is nothing but a change of variables. And uh, it involves the Q functions at one fermionic nodes and the Q functions at its two neighboring nodes. So the change of variable corresponds to changing the Q function at node A here by some other function QA tilde. And that uh, Q function is uh, expressed in terms of <laughs> the Q function at the neighboring nodes. So this is simply a definition of the change of variables uh, under a fermionic duality, where the plus and minus is here on the Baxter functions, it corresponds to translating the argument by I over two, plus or minus I over two. Okay, uh, under such a uh, transformation, the nature of the neighboring nodes in the thinking diagram change. If they were fermionic, they become bosonic and vice versa. Also the connections, uh, the nature of the connections in the thinking diagram change. And I'm not really uh, explain what they mean, but uh, they're related to the signs of the off diagonal elements in the Cartan matrix. Then one has to consider the case where the, the, the representation one is interested in, uh, whether it has a thinking label associated with the node that we dualize after or not. And if there's no, or the thinking label is zero for the dualized node, then nothing happens. But if it's non-zero, uh, then the thinking labels in this local region can change. And here's what they change like in a special case, where there's only a thinking label on the middle node, then it changed in this way here for the two possible types of connection one can have for the fermionic node. Uh, one can have more complicated thinking labels, but this is the only one which is relevant for, for ADS-CFT. Okay. Um, yeah, now under these uh, fermionic dualities, uh, we would like to understand how the, the OLF formulas change. Because the OLF formulas that encode the one-point function of the field theory and the one-point functions, of course, do not change. It's only the way in which they're expressed in terms of extra functions that changes. And the Baxter function uh, uh, itself at the dualized node is clear how it changes. And also the other Baxter functions, how they change, which is that <laughs> they don't change. But what is non-trivial is how the good determinant changes when you make this uh, duality transformation. And that you can try to study semi-analytically uh, using Mathematica. And uh, what you find is that there's a very nice transformation formula for the super determinant under these duality transformations, which is actually quite surprising. It can be written in a closed form, valid for any uh, any beta state uh, and any configuration of, of nodes in the local region around the node you dualize after. So let, let's assume we dualize after node A and replace the QA by some QA tilde. Then it turns out that this uh, combination QA at zero times the super determinant, it transforms in a nice way. Uh, QA tilde is the uh, Baxter polynomial after the transformation and D tilde is the uh, uh, super determinant of the Grenadian matrix after the transformation. So you see the transformation only involves the node after which we dualize and then some neighboring nodes. So this means that if our overlap formula involves this Baxter function, the QA of zero times the super determinant, either with QA in the numerator or in the denominator, then the formula which transform covariantly. And that, well, meaning that it has the same form in, in, in other gradings. And that is a very nice property, of course, that we could dream of having in, in uh, ADS CFT. Okay, so here's a graphical representation of what the duality formula does. So if we start out with a QA of zero in the numerator, this means numerator, 
and we make a dualistic transformation, then the QA moves to the denominator, and then we multiply by two Q functions at the neighboring nodes with arguments i over two. So this one means one in units of i over two. We could also have a formula which had from the beginning a QA of zero in the denominator, then the dualistic transformation would take it to the numerator and divide by two Q functions at the neighboring nodes. So you see that if we require that the trans of the if the, that the all our formulas are uh, covariant, then it's quite restrictive because then we can only have uh, Baxter polynomials evaluated as zero either in the numerator or the, the denominator if the formula is to transform in a nice way. Okay, so uh, first we can, as an exercise, try to see what this. Um, what implications this has for the, the all a formula that was determined by bootstrap um, by Gambo and Beinock. Uh, namely, we want to, by duality transformations, find out what the OLAP looks like in other gradings. So this is the formula I showed you some slides ago, which encodes the OLAP of the full n equals four Suryam mill theory in this alternating grading. And the notation is the same, zero is a Q, a Baxter operator taking at zero and one is a Baxter operator taking at value, the value i over two. And this, the lines here uh, symbolize whether the, the Q function is in the numerator or in the denominator. So in this, from this formula here, we can try to make a number of dualizations. And um, we can, for instance, dualize after the first and the last fermionic node. Then the, the dualization takes the Q function at zero from the numerator to the denominator, and it multiplies by one on the neighboring nodes. And it also changes the nature of the neighboring nodes. And one can do another duality transformation after the second and the sixth node. Then again, we move the Baxter function evaluated at zero from the denominator to the numerator, and we multi in this case, we divide by Q functions evaluated at I or two at the neighboring nodes. And the reason why this series of transformations is interesting is that this takes us from this uh, alternating thinking diagram to this thinking diagram, which is also sometimes denoted as a beauty thinking diagram. What is beautiful about it, in this connection at least, is that it has the SO6 thinking diagram as a sub diagram. And now we can compare our overlap formula to the overlap formula we had for the SO6 spin chain earlier. And we see that this overlap here, I don't know if you remember it, but it is exactly what was found for the SO6 uh, spin chain. So, so this shows that everything is, is nice and consistent. But now you can start wondering if you can actually go the other way. If, if we just knew the overlaps in the SO6 sector, could we then go in the opposite direction and determine the overlap formula for the full theory, just requiring it to be covariant under fermionic dualities? And, and the answer to that is affirmative. Let's assume we just have the OLAP formulas in this sector here. Then we can only, for the two fermionic nodes, have a zero either in the numerator or denominator. But it has to be in the numerator because otherwise we will get a mess with the ones when we dualize in the opposite direction. For the same reason, we can only have the one in the denominator here on the rightmost node because after one dualization in the opposite direction, we will get this one removed. If it was in the numerator, it wouldn't be removed. And we would not have covariance. And finally, this zero here in the denominator is also fixed because otherwise we would have problems if we wanted to do fermionic dualities at another level. So, so the requirement of fermionic duality actually fixes the complete overlap formula just from the knowledge uh, of what it looks like in the scalar sector. And now, ideally, I would like to show you how this can be used to derive some not known overlap formulas, namely in another theory, which is um, ABDM theory. Okay, so uh, ABDM theory is a three dimensional quantum gauge theory which enters another version of, of the ADS CFT correspondence. It has a dual string theory description, not in terms, of, in terms of type 2b strings, but in terms of type 2a strings. Uh, you don't need to know too many details about this theory, but let me just mention that it has n equals 6 supersymmetry in three dimensions. 
It has a field content, which consists of two gauge fields for wild fermions and for complex scalars. It has a product gauge group, UN times UN, and the gauge fields, they have transimers interactions with transimer le uh, levels K and minus K. So more precisely, the bosonic part of, of the field theory uh, Lagrangian looks like this. So you see that in particular, you have uh, rather complicated interactions for the scalars. They are uh, of sixth order. This theory also has a Hoof limit, like in equals four super young wheels, and that limit consists in setting n and k to infinity and keeping the ratio fixed. And uh, it's a close cousin of n equals four super young wheels in yet another uh, meaning, namely, this theory is integrable in the planar limit. Okay, so now we can play the same game for ABDM theory, try to look for defect setup. So now we're in three dimensions. So we introduce a, a two dimensional domain wall and we have the coordinate X2 perpendicular to the domain wall. Again, we have uh, the domain wall separating regions of space time with uh, different ranks of the gauge group. So in this case, it turns out that you need to choose the ranks of the gauge of the product gauge group a bit asymmetrical, and you'll see why in a minute. And in this case, we need that two of the complex scalars out of the four have some waves different from zero, or that is the kind of solution that exists at least. And to find out what the possible values for the waves are, we again have to solve the classical equations of motion for uh, the fields. But as you can see, now they are relatively complicated because the fields have sextic interactions, so the equations of motion are quintic. But like we, before we had the NAM equations, now we have something called the basu harvey equations, which uh, ensures supersymmetry. And it turns out that if we just solve these basu harvey equations, then we actually also get uh, a solution of the full uh, equations, uh, classical equations of motions for the scalar fields. Okay. Um, and this is what the solution looks like. As I said, there are two of the four classical fields which get a non-trivial web. It looks like this. Again, there's some small uh, representation matrix, so to say, in the upper left-hand corner. But in this case, it's not uh, quadratic, it's rectangular. It can have size Q minus one times Q, where Q has to be larger than or equal to two. And uh, the idea is the same, that the waves decay far away from the defect and diverge as a defect. But now this dependence on the distance is one or it involves a square root. And this is a correct dependence if you want a defect safety in three dimensions. So it all comes out very neatly. Um, here I have written down the matrices a little bit more explicitly. You see they are the only non-vanishing in the, so, so to say, diagonal region and the elements, they depend on Q in this way here. It's not that you need to pay special attention, but maybe you have seen these matrices in other physical problems. They appear in several places, and they are, in a certain sense, the square roots of the, of the Pauli matrices or, or SU2 representation matrices. Okay, um, so now you can play the same game in order to compute the one-point functions in this setup. They are, one-point functions are, of course, constrained in the same way as before. You find them by replacing the classical fields by their waves, and in this way, the conformal operators are eigenstates of an integrable alternating SU4 spin chain. And um, this is because to get a gauge invariant operator, you have to combine uh, the complex scalar, a complex scalar with its uh, Hermitian conjugate, which is again due to the fact that the scale, complex scalars they transform in the bifundamental of the gauge group. Uh, and therefore you need a spin chain uh, which has fundamental and uh, fundamental representation on the even side and the anti-fundamental on the odd side and so on. But otherwise the mapping works as before. And the Hamiltonian of the alternating integrable uh, SU4 spin chain, it, it takes this form here, which we will not need. We just need that it's integrable. P is the permutation operator and K is a, is a trace. Okay. Again, I can 
formulate the computation of one point functions as the computation of an overlap with a matrix product state. And in this case, I can choose my matrix product state in two different ways because I can either consider a spin chain with a fundamental representation on the even side or a spin chain with a fundamental representation of the odd side. Uh, the result should not depend on this choice because uh, of the cyclicity of the trace. So I have two ways of formulating the overlap uh, using two different matrix product states. Okay. Um, but now, actually, these um, classical fields in this case, they are not SU2 representations, but they are closely connected to SU2 representations. And the way to see that is to combine the, the complex scalars uh, two and two, so like define phi alpha beta as y alpha, y beta dagger. Then this phi alpha beta, when alpha and beta runs from one to two, can be viewed as a two by two matrix, and we can expand it on the Pauli matrices in this way here. And uh, then this phi matrix becomes a Q minus one times Q minus one dimensional matrix. Remember that the original uh, Y matrices, they were of size Q minus one times Q. Then you can write down the classical equations of motion again, or the basso harvey equations, and see what they imply for these double fields phi. And you find out that the phi's, they precisely fulfill the NAM equations. And that means that we have the solution from before where the phi i are given in terms of representation matrices of SU2. And in this case, the size of representation is Q minus one. And then this uh, last field phi, it fulfills a somewhat simpler equation that looks like this. And with this solution for the phi i's, phi becomes proportional to the identity matrix with some proportionality constant, which depends on Q. Okay, so there's a close connection to what we had before, and we expect the overlap formula to also have the same features as before. I notice that there's a particular simple case, namely if Q is equal to two, uh, then we get the generators of the one-dimensional representation of SU2, which are just zeros. And that means that only this delta function up here survives in the phi field. And that forces the neighboring Ys here to have the same flavor. And that means that our matrix product state in that case becomes a valence bond state, a uh, two-side uh, product state. So this is one example where the valence bond states, or another example where valence bond state comes up in ADS CFT. And you can do a similar trick with the opposite order of the Y fields, and then you relate this, the headed fields to a Q dimensional representation of SU2. Okay. Mm. Okay, so uh, let me show you what the overlap formula looks like in this case for the scalar sector of APDM theory. So, um, as always in a spin chain, all the states are described with respect to some vacuum state. And as a vacuum state, I can take something which has zero energy eigenvalue or in terms of operators as some operator which doesn't get any anomalous dimension. And I choose here to take this uh, protected operator as my vacuum state. Then the, again, the excited states are described in terms of some beta root associated to the three nodes of the thinking diagram for SU4. And uh, in this case, it turns out that the selection rules for non-vanishing overlaps says that the roots at the first node should be paired with the roots at the third node. And one has to deter, or it's natural at least to define the super determinant of the Godeng matrix using this type of grading, or the, this set two symmetry. And when one does that, one again finds a very nice formula for the overlap. It looks like this, it has the super the determinant of the Godeng matrix, and again, some Baxter polynomials. But uh, actually, amazingly, it involves only one Baxter polynomial. In this case, only the Baxter polynomial of the middle node, which is quite different from what we had in the Enagos 4 Suvayamios. And this is a graphical representation with some Baxter functions only at the middle node. And there's one Baxter function which occurs twice uh, that is outside this square root. And my final question is then, can we use this formula here to predict the OLAP formula for the full ABDM theory? 
just requiring uh, fermionic, uh, covariance under fermionic dualities. And uh, for the full ABDM theory, we have a possibility of four different thinking diagrams. The simplest one is this one here with just a single fermionic node. And that has the uh, issue four thinking diagram as a sub diagram, the one for which we know the overlap formula. And these different thinking diagrams are all connected by fermionic dualities. A duality transformation after this node gives this diagram. Then we dualize after the top node and get this diagram. And finally, we can dualize after this middle node and get the last diagram. And of course, the idea is that now we want to determine the overlap formulas for all these diagrams, just invoking covariance under fermionic dualities. And starting from our formula we had. Uh, we can do that. We need only two ingredients. We need to assume that the overlap formula is factorized, that it involves a super determinant and then some product of Baxter polynomials. And um, this first product here is a product of all nodes of the thinking diagram. And then the other products that just signify that we can have a given node, a number of Baxter polynomials in the numerator and some in the denominator. Apart from that, we need uh, to know how the Godin determinant deter, uh, transforms when we have not only two neighbors of a given node, but up to three neighbors in this case. And again, you can uh, study this semi analytically using Mathematica and you find that the uh, transformation formula generalizes easily instead of a product over the two neighboring nodes, we get a product over all neighboring nodes. And using that information, you can actually write down what the overlap formula must look like for all the four possible thinking diagrams of ABGM theory. This is what the result like, looks like. I will not go through the arguments uh, again, but uh, there's one new feature for this last, more complicated thinking diagram. The overlap formula is actually a sum of two terms. And this comes above because at the last step, you have this product of two Q functions here, which does not go away when you do the duality transformation, but you can make it go away by making use of the QQ relations, and that gives you a difference between two terms. So this is a slightly complicating factor of this in this case, but otherwise everything works. So, so uh, yeah, what I wanted to say is that these fermionic duality relations seem to be quite constraining for your overlap formulas. And that brings me to, to the end of my talk. So what we would like to do would probably be to to prove this formula for the OLAP that I just uh, had before, because it was conjectured on basis of these fermionic duality relations. Then there are a number of other things that would also be nice to prove. For instance, this duality transformation for the Godin determinant. It's very easy to state. It involves just some determinants and some polynomials, but it's actually surprisingly hard to prove, and it has not been proven analytically. Uh, then one could also dream of bootstrapping the ABDM formula to higher loop orders, as it was done for N equals 4 super young mills. Um, one could dream of studying other defect setups within ADS CFT, such as defects of code dimension 2 or others. Um, yeah, and I've listed a number of other open questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Charlotte. Is there any question? Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, and what uh, here you, you wrote that uh, MPS with higher bond dimension. So if I'm not mistaken, it corresponds to different representations of your um, uh, of this uh, classical field. Is, is it correct? Or? Yes, I, I was a bit too fast here because uh, my overlap formula <laughs> here is actually only for, for Q equals two. Yeah, it's for the simplest two dimensional representation of SU2. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah. yeah. So, so ex open problems would be to generalize this to to higher bond dimension. I, I yeah. See. Sorry, I got a bit uh, uh, confused. Could, at the could end. I ask another, another question, which mm. is, uh, I mean, naively, Williams bond state is is not really translational invariant. It's is a two side translational invariant, right? 
Be, because yeah. Uh, yeah it's a little bit like a, a neo state uh, mm -hmm. like in a, in, a, in a let's say Heisenberg spin chain mm -hmm. uh, but with NPS I presume that you would like to you would like it to be translational environment is it right or uh, yes yeah uh, because it's translational invariance because of the trace involved uh, in this definition but 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 how how to understand this uh, because with the villain's bound state is not translation environment while for NPS it is right. um, yeah but I think it's it's probably still a translational invariance because you sum over all Okay, so you, you yeah. consider like uh, both, like Neo, you consider like uh, yes, yeah. both. Uh, oh, okay, yes. I see. Like yeah. in this case where I had um, uh, for SO6 here, you see. Oh, okay, all okay. possible combinations. Yeah, okay, uh, thanks. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a very naive question. Uh, the definition of matrix product state reminds me of the, the matrix on that which has been introduced by uh, people like Derrida, Ivan, Sakim, and Pasquier in the context of uh, exclusion processes. So I was wondering if there is a more, more than a superficial uh, connection between the, the two. Uh, I'm sorry, but I could not hear. Can, can you <laughs> maybe okay. take off? The... Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Um, well, I, I cannot answer immediately. I will have to, to look at it and think about it. I, I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Other questions? If not, let's thank Charlotte again. Thank you. And uh, now we have lunch.